Well, thank you for those very kind words, uh, Barry and Joe. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's so good to see so many uh, people here tonight from, from a wide variety of backgrounds, from first-year law students, first-year business students, to former judges of the Supreme Court, from legal academics and legal practitioners, to people with very little experience of, uh, of the law, to people with extensive experience of the law. And really what I wanted to do tonight was to try and capture a little bit of something for everybody in this lecture. I wanted to look at four cases which have caught my attention over, over recent years and to, to delve into those cases a little bit and to say a word or two about, about those cases. So the four cases are on the, on the, overhead, uh, uh, on the overhead projector. Um, the case of Attorney General in Brake, which looked at the controversial issue of restitutionary damages in contract law and the reconceptualization of loss in contract law. The case of Park and I and Beavis, which looked at the penalty rule in contract law and recast that rule uh, in recent times. And the final two cases, Quinn and the Irish Bank Resolution Corporation and Patel and Mirza, cases looking at the illegality rule in contract law. So I want to start off by looking at this case of Attorney General in Blake, the significant case of Attorney General in Blake, a case which really reshapes our understanding of damages for breach of contract. And just by way of background, many of you will remember that where there's a breach of contract, in most cases the courts will not award specific performance of the contract, will not compel the parties to perform the contract. The primary remedy is the remedy of damages. And damages in contract law, as many of you will know, are compensatory in nature. They aim to compensate the innocent party for their loss, rather than punish the party in breach. So damages aim to compensate the innocent party, rather than punish the party in breach. Now, the traditional understanding has been that, that damages for breach of contract, as we've just said, are assessed on the basis of the innocent party's loss. They're not assessed on the basis of any profit gained by the party in breach. So as a result of the breach of contract, the innocent party may have suffered loss, but equally, the party in breach may have made a profit as a result of the breach of contract. And the traditional view, outside of cases such as fiduciary relationships, but the traditional view in normal contract cases is that restitutionary damages are not available. An account of the guilty party, the party in breaches, profit is not available as a remedy for breach of contract. And various reasons have been given for this. We see the quote there from Lord Justice Stein in the Surrey Council case where it talks about the uncertainty which would ensue from uh, recognising restitutionary damages and account of profits in normal contractual actions and also talks about a tendency for such damages to discourage economic activity. And I think this is certainly an area where the concept of an efficient breach has held some sway concept of efficient breach being that if you can breach a contract and make more profit elsewhere, whilst at the same time paying, paying compensatory damages to an innocent party, why shouldn't you be able to do that? That's economically efficient to do that. So the traditional view has been that damages for breach of contract in normal cases are based on the innocent party's loss rather than any profit made by the party in breach. Now we do see throughout the case law some suggestions that in exceptional cases damages assessed on the basis of the guilty party's profit may be awarded. One example is uh, from Hickey and Roach's stores. But the traditional view is that damages for breach of contract do not, are not assessed on the basis of the guilty party's loss. 
So our first case I want to, to say a few words about, the first landmark case I want to say a few words about, is this case of the Attorney General and Blake. Now, Blake wor worked for MI5, but was a Soviet informant. A Soviet informant. He was found out. He was captured. He was imprisoned. But he escaped from prison and fled to Moscow, where he lives today. Now, whilst in Moscow, he decided to write an autobiography. He decided to write an autobiography. And that book was published in 1990. Now, at the time Blake joined the Secret Service, he entered into a lifelong commitment that he would not reveal his activities working for MI5. But he wrote his autobiography, and in the autobiography, he revealed various issues about his time as a spy. The Attorney General, there was a breach of contract, the Attorney General tried to claim damages, not on the basis of any loss which the Secret Service had incurred. In fact, they'd probably not suffered any loss because by the time he published his book, much of this information was in the public domain anyway. So the Attorney General found it very difficult, impossible to show loss. So couldn't claim damages on the basis of the loss which it had incurred. So instead, the Attorney General sought to calculate, to quantify the damages on the basis of the profit which Blake had made through breaching his contract. Sought an account of profits, restitutionary damages, whatever you want to call them. So couldn't establish loss, sought to claim an account of profits. And the House of Lords with Lord Hobhouse dissenting, allowed this remedy in the case of Blake. Allowed the Attorney General to claim an account of profits for breach of contract. So it was able to take those royalties from Blake. Now, as we've said, that was a novel case. It went against the traditional position that damages for breach of contract are compensatory in nature. They aim to compensate the innocent party for their loss. And as the House of Lords said, Lord Nicholls giving the lead in judgment. In exceptional cases, the House of Lords felt, in exceptional cases, a just response to a breach of contract requires this remedy. The remedy of an account of profits. So in the exceptional circumstances of Blake, the Attorney General was able to claim an account of profits. To claim those royalties. Now, in reaching that conclusion, the House of Lords were unable to find any case which directly supported that conclusion. Any case which directly allowed the innocent party in a breach of contract case to claim an account of profits. But they did rely on one case, this case of Rotham Park, which Lord Nichols described as a solitary beacon. Now, Rotham Park involved a breach of a restrictive covenant. It involved the breach of a restrictive covenant. And houses were built in breach of this restrictive covenant. But the construction of those houses did not affect the value of the benefited land. So on normal compensatory principles, 
damages would have been nominal. Ruff and Park sought an order to demolish these homes which were built in breach of the restrictive covenant. And Mr Justice Brightman refused that order of demolition, thought that that would be too wasteful. Instead, in lieu of an injunction, Mr Justice Brightman awarded 5% of the developer's profit as damages. So it was not, the value of the land had not been affected by building these houses, by the developer building these houses in breach of the restrictive covenant. But Mr Justice Brightman awarded 5% of the profits the developers made from building these houses in breach of the restrictive covenant. Now what is impossible to tell from the reported case from the law reports of this case, is whether Mr Justice Brightman regarded those profits, the 5% award of damages, as compensatory in nature, or as a partial account of profits. Impossible to tell from the actual report. But a House of Lords held an Attorney General in Blake that Ruff and Park was some authority for an award of restitutionary damages, for an account of profits, for a full account of profits, despite the fact that the most which Rotham Park is authority for is a partial award of profits. Now the key question was going forward was, well, the facts of Blake were unusual. When would an account of profits be awarded for breach of contract? For a normal breach of contract outside of a fiduciary relationship, when could, going forward, the innocent party to a breach of contract claim an account of profits? And House Lords were not too helpful here. They said no fixed rules can be prescribed, but a useful guide was that the party, the innocent party, had a legitimate interest in preventing the defendant's profit-making activity. A legitimate interest in preventing the defendant's profit-making activity. Now, just to say a few words about, about Blake before we look at some of the cases which followed Blake. I think the first thing we can say about Blake is that there is an element of punishment there. There is an element of punishment in the Blake damages. It was very clear that they wanted to get Blake. So there was an element of punishment in or on the facts of Blake. The court also stressed the deterrent element of such an award that those damages would deter people from breaching a contract, and particularly a contract in this area where there were issues of national security at play. I'm not so sure that there is a real deterrent element in it, because it just returns to the pre-contractual position. The party in breach is in no worse position than before the contract. So perhaps the deterrent element is overestimated. But it was certainly a deterrent element uh, to this award. The key question is, well, when does a plaintiff or a claimant not have a legitimate interest in preventing the defendant's profit-making activity? In one sense, a party to a contract always has an interest in the performance of the contract. So the key question was, when does a plaintiff not have an interest, a legitimate interest, in preventing the defendant's profit-making activity. And would Blake apply to normal commercial contracts? Would Blake apply to normal commercial contracts? Certainly Lord Hobhouse, who dissented, put in a very strong 
warning against extending this remedy into the commercial sphere. I was very concerned about the impact, concepts of efficient breach, etc., of applying the account of profits remedy, the restitutionary damages remedy, outside of the highly unusual, highly exceptional facts of Blake. So Hobhouse was very concerned about that in his dissent. But the first case to apply Blake was a commercial case. The first case to consider Blake and to apply Blake was a commercial case. Esso Petroleum and NIAD. Now Esso Petroleum and NIAD involved Esso's price watch scheme where people who ran garages had to report the price of petrol being sold in the locality to Esso and Esso would adjust the prices accordingly. They would say you sell it on the on the four court floor lower than your competitors and we will sell it to you for lower. So the margin remained the same. Unfortunately in Esso Petroleum, NIAD did not pass on those savings to his customers. So there was a clear breach of there was a clear breach of contract. The problem was Esso really couldn't show with any certainty loss. Esso could show there was a breach of contract that NIAD wasn't passing on these savings, but couldn't show loss. Couldn't show that people were not buying petrol in that station as a result of this breach. Certainly back then, people were in the habit, I think, of buying petrol at the same petrol station. You went to your local petrol station, that's the one you went to within those margins. But the Vice Chancellor Morritt considered Blake and felt that this was an exceptional case and therefore an account of profits remedy was available to Esso. So straight away, the very first, the very first case to consider the Attorney General and Blake did not heed Lord Hobhouse's warning and applied this account of profits remedy in the context of a fairly straightforward commercial transaction. And there has to be a question there as to whether that really was the type of exceptional case which the House of Lords in Blake had in mind. Second case to consider Attorney General and Blake was the Experience Hendricks and PPX case which involved a breach of a settlement involving some of the recordings of Jimi Hendrix. And again, the problem was that the innocent party could not establish loss. Could not establish loss in the normal way as a result of these unauthorised use of the recordings of Jimi Hendrix. And the Court of Appeal declined to award Blake-type damages, declined to award an account of profits. But what they did award was what is called hypothetical release damages. So they declined to award a full account of profits. This wasn't exceptional in the Blake sense of the word. They didn't really deal with NIAD very convincingly. But they declined to, will de declined to award a full account of profits, but awarded hypothetical release damages instead. The amount which the innocent party could have demanded for a relaxation of the settlement agreement. If, instead of breaching the agreement, the party ultimately in breach would have sat down and said, look, I do want to use these recordings. How much will it cost me to relax the settlement agreement? And that was the loss, the hypothetical release damages. If there hadn't have been a breach, if the party would have sat down and said, look, I do want to use these recordings, 
what will it cost me to relax the settlement agreement? And that was calculated as a percentage of the profits. As a percentage of the profits. So as I said, they declined to award a full account of profits on the ground that it was not exceptional enough. Not exceptional enough. But it doesn't really explain why the facts of NIAD were exceptional enough. The final case I want to mention in terms of the Blake case and tracing the history of the Blake case is WWF against WWF. And this was uh, a case involving um, a settlement agreement between WWF and WWF. It's a good picture. I find that on the list. I thought it's not mine. And um, what's really interesting about the Court of Appeal decision in this case is that they felt it wasn't sufficiently exceptional to award a full account of profits. But what's very interesting about WWF is that the Court of Appeal regarded both the hypothetical release damages and the full account of profits as both compensatory in nature. So it regarded an account of profits in this context as compensatory in nature. It's hard to see how a full account of profits are compensatory in nature. But that's what Lord Justice Chadwick, that's the view Lord Justice Chadwick took. So what we see there's some more recent cases, we'll just skip on. What we see in the Attorney General and Blake are I think two things. And they fit into wider themes in contract law. I think the first thing we see in Attorney General and Blake, and we're still mapping this out as to just how far this remedy of a counter profit stretches. But I think we see two things. The first thing we see is the rise of the performance interest in contract law. The interest in performance. Now we, we may have an interest in performance where specific performance is available. But cases such as Ruxley, the cost of cure. Panatown on third party loss, very much looking at the performance interest in contract law. So, a rise of the performance interest as an interest which is being protected and being protected in the Attorney General and Blake uh, in, in the context of um, uh, a secret services agreement. I think what we also see, and we could trace this into into other cases in contract law in, in relation to contractual damages is a much more flexible approach to assessing loss, to conceptualising loss, to thinking about loss. And we see that particularly in relation to those hypothetical release damages. It's a slightly different way of thinking about loss in the context of general contract law. Perhaps borrowing some ideas from intellectual property law. It's a different way of thinking about loss in, in contract law. So the rise of performance interest, more flexible ways of thinking or viewing loss. Okay, so that was the first case, Attorney General and Blake. Second case I want to briefly mention is McDacy against Cavendish. Park and I against Beavis, the same, the same case, which looked at the penalty rule in contract law. Now, in very general terms, traditionally, the distinction between a penalty clause and a liquidated damages clause was that a liquidated damages clause was a genuine pre-estimate of damage, whereas a penalty clause was not a genuine pre-estimate of damage. It was penal in nature, seeking to punish the party in breach of contract. So it was about 
whether or not the clause in question was a genuine pre-estimate of damage or not. But I guess over the past 10 or 15 years or so, we see statements in some of the case law that a, that a wider approach to penalty clauses is perhaps desirable. An approach perhaps focusing on the legitimate interest of the party seeking to rely on the clause in question. We see that in the Court of Appeal, in Murray and Leisure Play. We see it in the ACC Bank case as well. So we see those suggestions that perhaps a wider approach is needed to penalty clause. Not just thinking about whether or not the amount set out in the clause is in proportion to the damage suffered or potentially suffered. So we see these suggestions that a wider approach is needed. Now those issues were considered by the UK Supreme Court in two conjoined appeals, McDessie and Parking Eye. Two conjoined appeals, two very different cases which called for a consideration of the penalty rule in contract law. McDessie was a commercial case which concerned a clause providing for certain consequences if a stipulation, a non-competition non stipulation was breached. And the question in McDacy was whether or not that was a penalty clause or not. Park and I was a very different type of case. It was a case involving a parking ticket. A case involving a parking ticket. And it was one of these situations where you go into a car park and the first two hours are free. But if you exceed those two hours, you had to pay a fee of £85. So in parking I and Beavis, the defendant parked his car for almost three hours, but refused to pay the £85 fee on the ground that it was a penalty clause and therefore unenforceable in contract law. At first instance and in the Court of Appeal, the defendant's argument failed. So those two cases, conjoined appeals, worked their way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court say that the law on penalty clauses needs to be recast, needs to be modernised. And what they said was that a penalty clause is a secondary obligation which bears no proportion to the legitimate interest which the innocent party has in the performance of the contract. No proportion to the legitimate interest which the innocent party has in the enforcement of the contract. So again, it's this concept of legitimate interest coming into the language of remedies for breach of contract. Now, applying that reformulated, remoulded test, the Supreme Court held that in McDacy, the relevant clauses were not penal. The buyer had a legitimate interest in compliance with the non-competition stipulations. And moreover, they were experienced commercial parties and the court was reluctant to intervene. In the Park and I case, the Supreme Court also held that the fee was not penal in nature. Okay, they said, it didn't represent the loss which the parking company suffered as a result of this breach. It didn't represent the loss, but nevertheless, the company had a legitimate interest in the efficient functioning of the car park, and the price was comparable to prices in the locality. So again, it's a focus on legitimate interests, not on whether the loss suffered is out of proportion to the amount payable, but it's about legitimate interest. 
Well, did the party have a legitimate interest in the performance of the contract? Now, I think that McDacy and Park and I raises as many questions as it answers. It raises the question about the precise relationship between the penalty rules and relief against forfeiture. It underlines the difficulty of distinguishing between primary and secondary obligations. Their lordships didn't agree on what was a primary obligation in the contract and what was a secondary obligation in the contract. Again, we see the emphasis on the performance interest and this vague notion of legitimate interest. Did the party seeking to rely on the clause have a legitimate interest in the performance of the contract? In a sense, all parties have a legitimate interest in the performance of a contract. So it doesn't really help us. Now, the Park and I and Beavis case has been considered by the Irish courts in two cases, but they have both deferred um, consideration of the parking eye case to the appellate courts. So we'll wait to see how, how the, the approach in, in parking eye is received here in Ireland. Okay, final couple of cases, and uh, Joe has warned me to to keep in time tonight. So, um, final two cases I want to look at it relate to illegality in contract law. Illegality in contract law. And uh, we're actually uh, very fortunate in the audience tonight to have Professor Rick, Richard Buckley from uh, uh, the University of Reading, who uh, uh, undoubtedly wrote the seminal book on illegality in contract. So, uh, if I get any of this wrong, he will no doubt. Uh, he will no doubt correct me. So I want to talk a little bit about some cases, one from the Irish Supreme Court and one from the UK Supreme Court on Ill illegality in contract law. And here we're dealing with agreements which are either wholly or partly unenforceable due to the contravention of a legal rule or principle of public policy. Now, traditionally, the courts were also reluctant to order restitution of benefits conferred under such contracts. So those contracts which infringed a legal rule or principle of public policy were unenforceable. And the courts were traditionally reluctant to order restitution of any benefits conferred under such contracts. And there were various reasons why it was said that the courts would not enforce illegal contracts and would not order restitution of any benefits conferred under a wholly or partially unenforceable contract. One of those, and perhaps one of the main ones which is emphasised in the case law, is maintaining the integrity of the legal system. However, the strict no enforcement and no restitution rule is not unproblematic. Firstly, the strict unenforceability rule, the rule against restitution, the prima facie rule against restitution, really fails to take into account the way in which regulation has developed in more recent times, the amount of regulation there is, the different types of regulation. So it really fails to recognise the different types of regulation with very different policy aims. It also may conflict with competing policy aims. You know, the um, policy aim perhaps of the prevention of unjust enrichment. So sometimes that policy of not enforcing illegal contracts runs into direct con conflict with other policy aims such as the prevention of unjust enrichment. And sometimes not ordering restitution 
of benefits conferred under legal contract can itself question the integrity of the system. So traditionally, if a bribe was given, that bribe was not recoverable. But as Lord Tolson said in the Patel case, that may actually undermine the integrity of the legal system. And there were also cases where um, either the contract was partly enforceable or restitution was available, such as the St. John shipping case. And it was very difficult to predict, to identify when that would be the case. So back in 1999, the UK Law Commission recognised or proposed reform of the illegality role in contract law. Felt that the present technical and complex rules governing the effect of legality in contract should be replaced by a discretion. Should be replaced by a discretion. So back in 1999, the Law Commission felt that it was time to change the rules on illegality. The strict no enforcement rule was problematic. And they recommended replacing it with a discretion, a structured discretion, which took into account various factors such as the seriousness of the illegality, the knowledge and intention of parties seeking to enforce the legal transaction, etc. However, by 2010, they changed their mind. The Law Commission had changed their mind. Partly, I guess, on the grounds of the complexity of reforming this area, but partly on the ground that it seemed that the courts were beginning to take into account competing policy aims more directly, more transparently. So there seemed to be some signs that the courts were trying to juggle these competing policy aims more directly. So in 2010, the Law Commission changed their mind and didn't recognise, didn't propose reform of this area of law and left it to the courts. Felt that it was in good hands with the courts. Well, over the past couple of years, there's been four illegality cases that have gone to the UK Supreme Court. And what we saw in those four cases was a real conflict between members of the Supreme Court. Those wanting a very strict, rule-based approach to illegality, and those wanting a more, a broader approach, a broader policy-based discretionary approach to illegality in contract law. So the Law Commission leaves it to the courts, but it becomes very clear in four UK Supreme Court cases there's a real difference of opinion as to the way forward. Strict rule-based approach or a much more flexible policy-based approach to illegality in contract law. About a year before Patel in Ireland, 2015 case of Quinn and Irish Bank Resolution Corporation Limited, the Irish Supreme Court also was grappling with the illegality rule in contract law and felt that a broad discretionary approach was not the way forward, that that would result in unacceptable uncertainty. What the Supreme Court said in Quinn was you had to look at the statutory regime and independently assess whether policy required particular contracts, the particular contracts affected to be treated as totally unenforceable. So the approach was not a broad discretion, it was statute specific, not case specific. Now we get to the UK Supreme Court case in Patel and Mirza, and they focus much more not on the concept of illegality, 
but on the remedies, and in particular, the availability of a restitutionary remedy. And there was this debate, as we've seen in the UK Supreme Court, between those who wanted to essentially maintain the existing strict approach to illegality, and those who wanted a broader, structured discretion to remedies in the context of illegal agreements. And it was those who wanted a broader, structured, discretionary approach to the consequences of illegality who won out, and the leading judgment was given by, by Lord Tolson. Now, what that meant was that in normal cases, if a contract was declared illegal, the parties could claim back property transferred under that illegal contract if the normal requirements of restitution of unjust enrichment were satisfied. So it kind of reversed the traditional rule. So what we've seen in illegality is a move to a more context-sensitive approach to illegality in contract law, Quinn, and at least in the UK, a broader policy-driven approach to the consequences of illegality. Really what main, remains to be seen is the extent the Quinn approach will stretch to determining what is actually meant by unenforceability. What are the parameters of unenforceability? Does that rule out restitution, etc., in any given context? And I think at that point I will stop because I've probably gone a little bit longer than I should have. But thank you very much for listening.